Hey guys, welcome back to a new video. In this video, I will quickly give you seven tips about clean code, how you can improve your code quality and build more stable projects. Number one is the so-called rule of three that you should stick to. Some people also call it one, two, refactor. So let me explain what that actually means. Most of you will probably know that repeating code in your project is a code smell. So if you have a line or just a code block um, that repeats itself at different places in your project, then that's pretty bad. Because if something changes in that piece of code, then you actually need to change it at all places where you actually use that. And what this rule of three now states is that as soon as you see the third occurrence of the same piece of code, you should refactor it and eliminate the duplicate code basically. So having the same code twice is okay in regards to that rule. So that actually prevents that you always look to yeah, make your code perfect and you actually forget caring about the essential functionality. So you're always just looking, oh, how can I improve the code? Can I refactor it? That's also not good, but you also of course should care about refactoring it just at the right time. So you see duplicate code twice, that's fine. As soon as you see it the third time, you actually refactor that piece of code, put it in a function, um, create a base class or whatever. Clean code tip number two is don't comment what happens. I see this happen so often, especially beginners do this, and this is not good. So let's actually take a look here in Android Studio. I have a simple function that finds a person inside of a list here that I simply hard coded. And here I just left a comment loop through persons list to find the right person because that's exactly what happens here. And that's the issue. We comment what happens. It should actually be clear if you look at the code here what happens. If that's not clear, then that's rather a sign that your code is not clean, that your variables don't have good names, that your functions don't have good names. So you should fix that instead of actually needing a comment to explain this. So when should you actually write comments in your code? You should write comments when there's something to explain why it happens. So if there's some, some part in your code and if somebody else actually sees that, they don't know why you do this. So they understand what happens there, but they don't understand why you actually do that specific thing. Then you can leave a comment explaining, hey, I do this because of that, that, and that reason. For example, I recently had some kind of artificial delay in, in a project of mine that was just necessary to eliminate a bug. And if you just see that delay, like just delaying your code for 100 milliseconds is usually pretty bad. That's something you don't want to do. But in that case, it was really necessary. And that really required a comment to explain why we have this delay. And that's how you should actually use comments to make your code a lot cleaner. So your colleagues can actually also understand why you do something. They don't need to understand what happens because they are all coders. They, they are able to understand your source code as long as you actually write it in an understandable way. However, if you are actually a beginner and you only work on your own hobby project and you're just learning something, then it can make sense to also comment what happens. So you just remember that. But as soon as you actually work together with other people, then it makes a lot more sense to eliminate these what comments and only have these why comments. Tip number three is kind of, yeah, it, it's related to tip number two with the comments. And that is that you shouldn't be afraid of actually choosing long names if that's necessary. So here in this file, you can see I have a function find person, which you've already seen. And we could actually improve the naming of that because, well, right now, if we just take a look at this function name, we don't really know by what it uh, actually finds the, uh, the person because we find the person by its first name or by its name, whatever. So we can also name it like that. So find person by name. That makes the function longer, of course, but that's not an issue if it makes the, the purpose of it actually clearer. So all in all, your function and variables names should be as short as possible, but as long as necessary. So you should always ask yourself, if you just look at the function name or the variable name, do you know what's the purpose of this function without actually looking at the code? If you can do that and if you understand it, then you have a good function name. Tip number four is that you should avoid genius code. Let's take a look what I mean with that here in Android Studio. Most of you will probably know the common fizzbuzz problem, which is commonly used for interviews. So it's basically a problem that you should um, print the numbers from one to a hundred. And let's actually take a look at this one here. And if 
the number is actually divisible by 15, you print fizzbuzz. If it's divisible by 5, you print buzz. If it's divisible by 3, you, you print fizz. And in all other cases, you just print the number. And of course, there are now different ways to solve this, which this file should actually show you. This code here, I already <laughs> switched down to it because it's more understandable, is the better code here, if you actually think of it from a software engineering perspective, than this code. Because, yeah, look at that. What does it do? Um, you, you have no idea, but both these problem, uh, both these functions actually solve the same problem. They do the exact same thing. However, this one is the actual genius solution because it, it is pretty smart to find the solution. Not gonna lie here. Um, it's also not my solution, by the way. I found this in the internet. But this one is, of course, much more readable because you just have that clear for loop, that clear one expression. And you see, okay. If it's divisible by 15, I print this, then print this, uh, this, and this. If you see this, then you don't know, okay, why do I have a map here? Why do I have a map off here? What does that mean, 0 to i, and why do I um, take the first element of that? You don't really know that. So really prevent using these genius solutions, even though you're proud of these, if you're actually a software engineer, because your colleagues will just uh, sit there and they have no idea what your code actually does. So overall, readability should usually be one of the highest goals you should have with your code. Very often it's actually preferred over performance as well. So if you just have small performance benefits and actually a cost of readability, then I would typically use, uh, I would typically prefer um, the more readable approach there. Of course, if it doesn't have any really significant performance disadvantages. But read read readability is actually super important if you work together with other developers on your project. Tip number five is a big one, and that is the so-called law of Demeter. And what the hell does that mean? So let me give you a more understandable example here. Let's say you want to bake some cookies. And for that, you of course need some ingredients. The law of Demeter now states that you can use your own ingredients that you purchased in the supermarket. You can use those ingredients that you actually harvested in your own garden. And you can use those ingredients your neighbor actually gave you. However, what you're not, what you should not be able to do is you should not be able to take the ingredients for your cookies that the neighbor of your neighbor actually has. And in terms of coding, that means that you should actually only be able to directly access the fields of a class that you use. Sounds very complex. Let's jump into our studio and try to understand this. I have a simple my timer class here that just represents a very simple timer. It uses the Java timer here to schedule a task. Doesn't matter what it does here. And then we have a clock, another class that actually uses the timer. And you can see this is against the law of Demeter because this clock class can access the actual timer of timer and do something with it. So as soon as you have a rather long chain here of these references, that's something you want to avoid. So of course, you can avoid this by simply making this timer private. And then you suddenly can't access that anymore. So instead, if you want to cancel it from here, you should make a uh, cancel function in this my timer class. So private, actually not private, just function cancel and you say timer dot cancel and that way you can get rid of this and that's on the one hand much more readable and also much less error prone so all in all if we take a look here um it is fine to actually use the dependencies that were given to a class like the starting time here it is allowed to actually use the dependencies that the class itself creates so like this timer object here and it is actually yeah and you also are allowed to use the dependencies of the um and the references of the objects you create here so for example the timer functions of course that is fine but you're not actually you shouldn't actually be able to access more than that so actually subclasses of this timer that the timer creates and then um calling functions on that so i, th I think that's clear with the example i actually showed you below tip number uh six we are currently and that is you should avoid side effects. Let's first of all understand what a side effect is. In the end, a side effect is just something that escapes the scope of a single function. 
And in terms of coding here, if we take a look at this other timer class I created here, really doesn't matter what it does again. Just a while true loop and we delay it for a second. And then we increase the time here by one, which is a global variable. And that would be a side effect because that's something we wouldn't really expect that happens if we call this function that some kind of variable that is not related to this timer class or to anything else of this class is suddenly changed. Because if you call this function and this is actually increased and you don't expect this, then this can really lead to unexpected states in your application. It can lead to bugs because yeah, just things happen that you don't expect to happen. So just be careful if your classes actually change objects that are um, actually not contained in this class themselves. Instead, if they are somewhere else, maybe static fields, that's always a little bit dangerous. So be careful with that. And of course, make this a member variable in this case. So it's actually part of this MyTimer class. And the last tip I have for you is tip number seven, avoid if else. And that might be shocking for some of you because yeah, if else is a very, very common code construct you very often use. Let me show you what I mean with that. And you can also directly see, I don't really have an else statement here. Um, it's not strictly related to if else, but also, yeah, it can also be just applied to normal if statements. Let me show you the issue here. We have another timer, <laughs> a surprise, this time with an is active boolean. And when we call start ticking, we check, of course, is the timer currently not active? Because if it is already active, we don't want to start it. If it's not, we then start it and we just um, use our same while loop again. The issue here is this if statement. The problem is that it simply adds one indentation here to our code. And if you have a more complex function, then this can really mess up your code and make it more unreadable. We can actually rewrite this code by simply pulling this out of the if statement and we simply say, okay, if the timer is already active, we simply return out of this function and we suddenly get rid of the single indentation. And the same way, some people would now use an else statement here. So if the timer is not active, we would actually do this code here, but that's not really necessary. So we can completely get rid of this else statement because yeah, we, we will only reach this code here if the timer is actually not active. Because if it was active, we would have already returned here and jumped out of the function. And if you actually enjoy this video and learn something new, then you will also love my video about anti-patterns in Android. So specifically for Android apps, if you want to see that and learn about patterns you definitely should avoid in your code, then simply click here.